that your Holy Spirit does the teaching. Lord God, we pray if there's anything that in our lives needs to be dealt with or touched or improved or corrected, Lord, just give us instruction in righteousness as your word tells us. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. I have to tell a little bit about the lock-in that we had uh, Friday night. Um, how, many be, how many here are the youngest in their family where you had siblings that are older? Okay. So um, we're over here on this monitor. I've got the Xbox One hooked up, and we're playing. Uh, it's called soccer. So it's soccer while you're driving a car, and, you, and it's a team sport. So you get two teams, right? So it was awesome. I mean, I'm just loving it. I'm sitting over there, and um, they're not in the sanctuary, so it's okay. Um, but my older son is playing. My younger son's 11. My older that older son is 13. And um, there comes a few key points where my youngest son is able to score a goal just like at the last final second. And I have to tell you, when you're the youngest and you do something over your older brother, there was a look of triumph on his face. I never saw a grin as bold as Cole was just like, I did it to you. You went down. And I don't know how that applies to the Bible, but it was a great moment. So let that be a blessing to you. All right. We've been looking at the woman at the well in John chapter 4. Where was she from? Samaria. And Jews have no dealings uh, with Samaritans. So Jesus and the King James, Wanda, had a must-needs-to-go Samaria moment. And he, most Jews would even avoid, even one or two days travel, avoid going through Samaria. Uh, remember that uh, Samaritans had a mixed uh, belief system of Judaism and uh, pagan beliefs, and uh, so they uh, really disliked Samaritans more than they did Gentiles, and that's saying a lot. So long story short, uh, Jesus meets this woman, and she arrives uh, at the heat of the day, and that tells us that um, normally women in that culture would have gone there to have a conversation. It would have been social. And so we get the feeling, because Jesus talks to her, and identifies that, uh, well, in fact, she's had five husbands, and she's living with a guy right now, and she's unmarried. And so we get the sense that there was shame in her situation. She was probably an outcast from the area in which she lived, but she wasn't to Jesus. He didn't cast her out. He doesn't cast her aside. Now, when he shows up, he asks her for a drink, but the tables turn. And what he's trying to do is he's trying to give her living water. It's an illustration. We, today, that well that they have excavated, or I believe might be still active, is 75 feet deep. And so, you know, she asks, Sir, you, you know, you're going to give me living water, and, and you don't have a ladle? Are you like Stretch Armstrong? How are you going to pull that off? And uh, what he's doing is he's moving from the physical need to the spiritual need. Okay, so the tables have turned in our study, and now she's asking for a drink. And uh, you know, when you have been married uh, five times, and you're you're living with somebody, and you're not married, um, she's still thirsting. She's not satisfied. So it's interesting. Um, Jesus had an appointment with her, a divine appointment to meet with her. That's why it says she mu he must needs to go to Samaria. And so um, here's the thing, though. If she doesn't get confronted with her sinfulness, then she's not going to be excited about the cure. And people need to know that they are uh, sinners, that everybody, if you've got skin on, you fall short of God's word. Even the best person that you know um, has lied at some point. They've taken something uh, that isn't theirs, and so uh, everyone's in need of a Savior. And so, again, if she isn't confronted with her sinfulness, then she's not going to be excited for her need for a Savior. And that could be addressing some people here this morning. And so her Savior uh, goes to confront her, and the reason that he brings up her sin, I believe, because he says to her, um, go call your husband. And she's like, I don't have a husband. And he's like, that's right. You've had five, and the one you're, you're living with right now isn't your husband. And so she begins and says, um, sir, I perceive that you're a prophet. You know, this isn't the conversation I walked into. And um, he has to confront her about her sin because let's just say that he doesn't, okay? Let's say that she receives Christ what we know from our walk with Christ is that later on, the devil is going to whisper in her ear and say, 
oh, you're not really saved because if only God knew your dirty little secrets, then he wouldn't have accepted you. And that's not truth, right? So, um, Amazing Grace, we sing that song, and it says, you know, Amazing Grace that saved a wretch like me. And that's for all of us. We were all lost, and now we're fine. We were all blind, but now have been set free. And so, if you're a believer here this morning, and you realize um, how far that God has brought you from where you were before Christ, it doesn't lead you to condemnation. I hope you know that this morning. It actually leads you to um, truth and, and a greater love, and you realize how broad his forgiveness is for you. Amen? So we're going to pick up in John four nineteen. Uh, again, the woman said to him, uh, Sir, I perceive that you are a prophet, because you just told me very personal things about my life, and, well, I've never met you before. And... Uh, this would actually rank him a little higher than a prophet. Um, and remember she asked before, are you greater than um, our ancestor Jacob? And so, uh, yes, yes he is. And so he's getting her on that path. Verse 20, our fathers worshiped on this mountain and you Jews say that in Jerusalem is the place where one ought to worship. Okay, sometimes when you're talking to somebody and it gets personal and, and people don't like for other people to get into their lives, right? We don't like for people to get into our personal business. She could have been pulling like a, uh, a detour at this point, okay? She could have been trying to bring up something to kind of get him off track. We don't know that, okay? But what she does uh, ask, again, is, uh, you know, basically where, um, where is it right to worship? And her locale is actually Mount Gerizim, and that was the place uh, where the Samaritans actually worshiped at that time uh, and they offered uh, blood sacrifices actually there and so they built their own mountaintop on Mount Gerizim and so the question that sh uh, she asks is about a rival worship system um, that mountain stood there that temple on Mount Gerizim stood there till about 129 BC when a guy named uh, John Hyrcanus destroyed it uh, he was a Maccabean ruler and so they had no temple at this time that this occurs with Jesus, uh, but again, they're still offering blood sacrifices every year on top of that mountain. In fact, they still do to this day. Um, and the last statistic I saw is that there are actually uh, between 600 and 700 Samaritans that are still alive today. So they're still doing that today. Now, the point that I want to make here this morning is that um, her own religious background tainted her view of God, okay? Do you guys remember which books of the Bible the Samaritans believed in? It begins with a T. The Torah, right? So they believed in the first five books of the Bible, but they didn't believe in all the Old Testament, so they only had partial revelation, right? Okay? So um, she needs more information, and there are going to be people that come in here Sunday morning, Wednesday night, and that's where we can come in. Right? We can point them to the Word of God to help them to get better revelation in their lives. Okay? Now, all of us in this room have been shaped by our upbringing. I mean, whether you were raised Christian, uh, some people are raised without any religious experience at all. Uh, some people grow up in a legalistic religious system. And sometimes it can be very hard to overcome our traditions. I'll give an example of a tradition. Why do we pray with our eyes closed? Because we just do it. <laughs> there's nothing in the Bible. In fact, there's a lot of different uh, physical ways that people pray in the Bible. A lot of people will raise their arms to heaven or whatever. But it actually originated, I think, because like um, teachers and kids' church wanted to make sure that kids were like being in, in line, you know? Close your eyes. Stay away from Susie, you know, kind of a thing, okay? But we all have traditions, Okay, and sometimes those are very hard to overcome. For example, people will expect a pastor to wear a suit or that we have hair combed a certain way or whatever, you know, not listen to Nirvana. I don't know, you know, there's, there's a lot of things that we just kind of impose because we think that's the way it's supposed to be. But what this woman is going to find out as an example is that worship isn't confined to a place. Just in case you didn't realize, this church is just a building. It's just the sheep shed. We are the church. So worship for us can happen anywhere. 
not just in this building. So let's look what Jesus said. In verse 21, Jesus said to her, Woman, believe me, the hour is coming when you will neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem worship the Father. And then he says, You worship what you do not know. We know what we worship for salvation is of the Jews. Now, if you catch this, you'll catch the heart of Jesus. And it's something that we should all pick up on. He doesn't say, woman, you floozy. You know, woman, you know, I'm trying to think of a word to say. But he's, he, he doesn't call her or whatever, you know. He, he looks at her, okay, in the way that somebody's going to look at somebody's little girl. Because that's who she was. She was some father's daughter. Okay, at some point she was a happy toddler. Right? Remember the rules of a toddler? If I have it, it's mine. If I have it handed it to you, it's fine. You know, it's mine. Okay. Um, he doesn't see somebody uh, as just like a sinner without hope. And uh, she did not say to herself at any point in her life, I want to be a failure. Um, I want to have five husbands. Okay. So that's how Jesus sees her, and that's how we are to see people. Okay, and the way that we do that is we're going we're gonna to read the word of God and the Holy Spirit's going to activate that inside of her. So in answer to her question, he says, okay, the Jews are right to worship in Jerusalem, but that's about to change. Verse 23. But the hour is coming is, and is now when the true worshipers, <laughs> worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth, for the Father is seeking such to worship him. So again, she had been confining worship to a place uh, Jesus says it's not about the place, it's about the person. To worship in the Spirit means that you're, con you're concerned with spiritual realities. Um, oftentimes, we might even say, like, after today, well, how was worship today? And what we're saying is, how was the song service? If we were really talking maybe about our personal lives, we might say, you know, during worship, um, I lifted my hands, or I lifted my heart, I closed my eyes, and God let me know my finances are going to be okay. You know, if we're going to talk about worship, we're going to say, for example, you know, I've had this resentment, or I want to slap my boss, you know, or my neighbor, or, or whoever, or, you know, you fill in the blank. And then God said, you know what, be still and know that I'm God. In fact, do a Psalm 4-4. Go get quiet on your bed, and then just meditate on me, and I've got the answer for you. And that's what happens during worship, because this communication between me and God, and you and God. And so it, it's, a, it's a process, but it's not, really has very little to do Thankfully, with how well we play music, you know, praise God. Um, but it's really, it's really personal. Okay, so your concern, number one, to worship in spirit means you're concerned with spiritual realities, uh, not with outward uh, vestiges, if you will, or, or trappings. Now, to worship in truth means that we're going to worship according to the Bible. There are a lot of people that take a lot of liberties, you know, during a service. Um, I've heard of churches where people are like laughing in the spirit or barking like dogs, or you know, a lot of these kind of interesting things. And then they, they don't even get to the Bible. They don't even get to the Word of God. So we need to worship in spirit and truth. It's important that we do it biblically, right? Okay. So, um, and not only that, and I was talking to a brother just uh, over the weekend that's going through a hard time, and one of the things he told me is that um, he doesn't want to be fake when he worships. He doesn't want to sing words and say, oh, Lord, you know, I love you and I'll do this to you, you know, with you forever, you know, kind of a thing. He wants to make sure that he's being real with God and I respect that because I know God does and God knows his heart and the truth of the matter is is that God will get him back to that place to where the, the words line up with his heart, okay? So verse 24, God is spirit and those who worship him must worship in spirit and truth. And the woman said to him, I know that Messiah is coming who is called Christ and when he comes, he would tell us all things. So that lets us know that she has re religious knowledge. Has it been changing the way that she's lived? No. That's, that's the greatest evidence. If you have debate with people over uh, creation, um, evolution, um, how can God allow evil, these kind of things, those things have their place in our society, but the truth of the matter is the greatest evidence for the working of God is a changed life. And so a lot of times we're helping people with vocabulary terms. You know, tonight we're going to have a testimony. What in the world's that? 
house to money, you know, hang out and have donuts and coffee afterwards. We call it fellowship. Fellowship, you know, we have to kind of define the terms sometimes, but what happens and what's going to happen with her is that Jesus is going to cause such a change on the inside of her heart and her life that she, it's going to cause her to take action, okay? And that's, again, evidence, that's fruit that God is doing something in her life. Let's just say that she doesn't change, then she walks away from this conversation and she knows about the Messiah and she knows about Christ, but it isn't changing the way that she lives. And, and it's good for us this morning, right, to just do a check and say, Lord, how am I doing? Right, what is it, uh, Psalm 51? Lord, search my heart. You know, show me what ways are in me that are contrary to you, okay? So um, again, she's in a place where um, she's an outcast. She probably avoided other women, you know, socially at this point. But after her discovery of Jesus, she's going to have a boldness where she's going to talk to the people about Jesus that more than likely are shunning her. Anybody here see the office? Dwight Schrute, shun, unshun? Okay, never mind. All right. So, okay. So this is the evidence of a changed life. She's wanting to help people uh, who currently have contempt for her. That's the power of God. When you get people that treat you badly and you care enough about them to tell them about Jesus Christ, that is evidence of a changed life, okay? So verse 26, Jesus said to her, I who speak to you and am he. Okay, so though this woman is a sinner, Jesus reveals himself to her because Jesus reveals himself to sinners, and that's good news. Verse 27, and at this point his disciples came and they marveled that he talked with a woman Yet no one said, what do you seek, or why are you talking with her? And we said last week that a Orthodox Jewish male would not even talk to his wife or his daughter in public. So for him to talk to a strange woman, wow, it's almost like it's a God moment, right? Okay? So culturally, the, culturally this wasn't done by an Orthodox Jew. And John uh, must have been an eyewitness here, so he would have remembered this kind of shocking event. Verse 28. The woman then left her water pot, went her way into the city, and said to the men, Come see a man who told me all things that I ever did. Could this be the Christ? So the jar that she came to fill with natural organic water is empty, but the heart that she came not to fill is now overflowing with living water. Now, a miracle greater than, because you guys remember, what was the first miracle that Jesus performed in Cana? Okay, yeah, he turns water into wine. This is a greater miracle, okay? That prevented a husband and wife from cultural embarrassment probably for years or the duration of their marriage. This has to do with eternal life. That's why it's called living water, okay? Very meaningful here. So uh, she says, he told me all things that I ever did. You know, the Jewish people actually believed that the Messiah that was coming, the essential characteristic of the Messiah was that he was going to be able to tell all the secrets of people's hearts. So if you look at Isaiah 11, verses 2 and 3, this is a fulfillment of that prediction. And it isn't unreasonable to, to really believe that Samaritans thought the same things about Messiah. So verse 30 says, Then they went out of the city and came to him. And then in the meantime, his disciples urged him, saying, Rabbi, eat. Now, you've got to love the disciples because he's doing the work of the ministry and what's on the minds of the disciples? Falafels and pita bread. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's just like a man to be hungry, isn't it? Okay, so verse 32, he said to them, I have food to eat of which you do not know. I read this uh, in uh, Calvary Chapel, uh, Marietta Brian Bell has got a commentary. He said, during World War I, there was a great weed harvest in Australia that rotted in the fields. And it was because so many men had responded to the call of the colors that nobody was left to gather in the grain harvest. So it was a case of reap or rot. And this is exactly the situation that we face in our churches today. Okay? A plentiful harvest and few reapers. You know, and I don't think a lot of times re people realize just um, the power and the ability that we have just to be for people, be there for people. Okay, a lot of people come in, you know, they're hurting or they're in a, in difficult life situations. We can be a pair of ears and a heart for them. You know, and I think one of the things that I love maybe about humility in Christ. Wait for it. You don't have to know all the answers. 
Men, this is for us, okay? You don't have to know all the answers. Sometimes, I know this is hard, sometimes we can listen. We can listen. We can do it. We can do these things. I've, I've talked to my wife before. She was like, stop trying to fix me. Let me get it out. Okay? And, and again, we know where to go. We know where to go to for truth. We know to where to go to for the answers. And we can teach people what we are, ourselves do is we read the word of God, we pray, and then we allow him to speak through our lives. And amazingly, sometimes he'll even speak during the teaching of the word of God. It'll align with our lives. So, um, a good question to ask the Lord as you're driving here and you wonder why there's marshmallows in the parking lot um, is to ask and say, say, Lord, who's, who's new that's going to be coming here this morning? Can I introduce myself? You know, and Lord, who is hurting? Lord, is there a way that I can minister to them? Now, people might be freaked out and they might leave quick and, and that's okay. But again, um, Mark and I are getting ready to start a, a prayer journal uh, uh, together, and uh, one of the things that, uh, I actually shared this in a job interview one time, when we are taking God's word, and we're praying, and we're writing down dates, and then we're writing down answers to our prayers, that's a sign of an active, living, viable relationship with God. We're not talking about, well, back in the 80s, when we had huge hair, and, you know, girls had hairspray, and poked people's eye out with that hair, you know, and had boom boxes. We're talking about Jesus of 2017, that's important, okay? So, um, if you will, we're going to move now to uh, the healing of the nobleman's son. Uh, Skip Heitzig said that by, uh, it's been said by those that climb telephone poles. Anybody here ever climbed a telephone pole? Bruce has? Okay. All right. Apparently, it's <laughs> I'm not going to ask why. Um, <laughs> love you. <laughs> Okay, apparently it takes a lot of faith to, uh, to climb a telephone pole. Um, they have to wear special shoes with spikes to grab the surface of the pole. And you're told that you have to trust in the equipment when you're climbing a telephone pole, that you have to be able to lean back into the harness. Now the problem with that is that it's counterintuitive to being elevated in the air. You're not thinking, lean back, trust the equipment. You're thinking, fall down and die, right? But the thing is, is that at 40 foot in the air, even though you wouldn't think to do such thing, it makes more sense in your mind to grab whatever's closest to you, but that would be the worst thing that you can do on a telephone pole. Uh, it typically takes only one rough slide down a splintery pole before a climber really gets it. And that person will learn to lay back, lean back, and trust the equipment. Okay, the end of John chapter four is a story about faith and trust and leaning back and trusting the equipment that God provides. And so we've got a man who's going to ask Jesus to heal his sick son. And the Lord's going to do that, but all the while, Jesus is kind of pushing this guy back to trust in the harness, okay, which is counterintuitive. So verse 46, Jesus came again to Cana of Galilee, where he had made the water wine, and there was a certain nobleman whose son was sick at Capernaum. When you read that word nobleman, um, it's ba basilicus, uh, which is a royal official. It's a person of prestigious rank. Uh, he probably was one of Herod's trusted officers. Verse 47, when he heard that Jesus had come out of Judea into Galilee, he went to him and implored him to come down and heal his son, for he was at the point of death. So he doesn't go to Herod. He goes to Jesus, of all people, the very source of life. And what we're going to look at here this morning are stages of belief that this man has, because there are stages of belief. So he comes with one stage, but he's going to leave with an entirely different level of faith in Christ. So there's three statements of truth that talk about how God develops faith in us. And the first one is, uh, this will be shocking for you, life can be hard, it drives us to Christ. So if you can't relate to life being hard, talk to somebody else that's here, they'll let you know. Life can be hard. Uh, it drives us to Christ. Why do I say that? It would appear that this man would not have come to Christ if his son wasn't sick. I'm not saying Jesus caused or God caused the sickness to happen. What I'm saying, the text indicates that this man would have stayed a Gentile. He would not have come to Jesus Christ, okay? So he travels 20 miles from Capernaum to Cana. And, uh, you know, it's interesting, but infirmity, difficulty, or flat-out regular vanilla pain 
often drives, draws more people to Christ than prosperity. Most people, when life is great and you're the captain of the football team, you're the head cheerleader, yada, yada, that's not typically when you come to Christ. It's usually when things are hard, right? Okay, who here this morning has been drawn to Christ because of difficulty and pain? Okay, there we go. All right. So we read that the man, uh, when it says that he implored Jesus, it means he kept on begging him over and over, heal my son. And if, you, and if you're a parent, you know what that's like. You would trade places with that kid. So, now this guy is a, a nobleman, right? We read that. Basilicus, okay? So do you think it's within this man's character to beg somebody else for a healing? Not a chance. Now that lets me know that in order to come to Christ, we all have to deal with pride. Okay, and what pride says is, you know, I got this. I don't need help. I can live my own life, okay? And Jesus, the, the God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, God's a gentleman, and he's not gonna force you to accept him, okay? But in this life, there will be pain, and what he will do is he will come to you as a gentleman, and he will say, you know what, if you call on me, I will answer you, and I will show you great and mighty things which you know not, is what Jeremiah says, okay? So, um, this guy is... Uh, dealing with his own pride issue. All right. You know, it's funny um, regarding prayer. There are people that I've noticed that aren't believers that will ask believers to pray for their situation. So I almost, I don't know if we're like uh, lucky rabbit's feet to people, but bring it on, okay? Let's just be rabbit's feet for Jesus. That'll be our new slogan. Or not. Okay, my wife won't go for that. Okay. All right. This is kind of like the book of Jonah in reverse because when Jonah is running from the Lord in the midst of the storm, all the pagan guys are praying. There's one person in the bottom of the boat during the storm in the book of Jonah who is not praying. Who is that? Jonah. Prophet of God, not praying. Prophet of God gets swallowed by what could be, I don't know, a sperm whale or something, something crazy, something big. And immediately does he pray? No. Yeah, that's, that guy's got a hard exterior. Okay, second point, statement of truth. Christ can be surprising. God wants us to grow. And this man is surprised at Jesus' statement, and this isn't the answer that you want from Jesus. Jesus. You want Jesus to say, he's healed. But that's not what he says, okay? So Jesus says some pretty interesting things because he's working with people. And we are a quirky bunch, Okay, we're, we're interesting folks. So remember the Canaanite woman that comes to Jesus in Matthew 15, 21? Her daughter is demon-possessed. I have so many jokes running in my head right now about kids, but I'm not going to say anything. Okay, but in this situation, her daughter's demon-possessed, and this is what Jesus said to her request. It is not right to take the children's bread and toss it to the dogs. Wow, what? <laughs> what did you just say to that woman? But again, if you're a child of God, he isn't always going to answer your prayers the way that you like it. A lot of times we really help out new believers in Christ when we say sometimes God says no, or even better, wait for it, sometimes God says wait. Okay? We don't want those answers, but, and we've talked about this on Wednesday night in our ministry class, God is in the process. We are looking for wabam results. God is in the process. And here's the thing. Something must need to occur in that process for us to grow. Okay? So, notice the nobleman asked him a question. But again, Je okay, so the nobleman asked Jesus a question, but Jesus answers with you people. Now, the reason he's doing that is because he's in Cana of Galilee. What happened in Cana of Galilee? He turned water into wine, right? So you got people showing up for a fireworks show. Where's the crazy wine-making water kind of guy, rabbi guy? We need to come see this guy, okay? They didn't have internet back then or, or Netflix, okay? So the people, a lot of people are following him because they wanted a fireworks show. And so this guy has, and what those people had was a shallow, sign-based faith without a commitment to Christ. Now, here's a great question. Do you really believe this morning that God is in charge of your life, your existence? 
if we know, if, if that's true, then when he tells us answers to our prayers like no and wait, we're okay with that. You know why we're okay with that? We've done things on our own enough to know it's better to follow God's will. Amen? You better give me an amen for that. All right? New people are like, what did we come to? Okay. So do you believe that God is in charge of your existence? He is more interested in our spiritual growth than our physical comfort. He really is. So he prescribes and he allows hard times. He wants to knock off rough edges. And Peter said the trials that you experience are so that your faith, which is more precious, which is greater than gold, uh, may be refined by the fire and may be proved genuine in 1 Peter 1, 7. A guy named P.T. Forsyth said it is a far better, greater thing to pray for pain's conversion than to pray for pain's removal. We usually pray for the pain removal. In store, instead, we should pray, Lord, you know what, I hate this, but I trust you. Please show me what it is you want me to learn in this instead of just take away the pain, okay? So 49, verse 49, he, uh, the nobleman said to him, Sir, come down before my child dies. So my next point is that faith can be weak, uh, but it has to be developed, okay? So this guy had very weak faith, and he really, at this point, doesn't care about the source of the power. He just wants his son well. And I mean, you can't, as a parent, you can't blame him for that. But the, the thing, the truth of the matter is, is that Jesus is going to give him a faith lift, okay? So a point to consider is this, and, and you'll hear this in prayer meetings. Don't tell Jesus basically what to do. <laughs> Have you figured that out by now? God, do this. No, no. We ask him, Lord, this is what your word says. Will you please do this? What did Jesus pray in the garden? Thy will, not mine, be done. There's a, there can be a power struggle when you're commanding God, who controls the universe. When you're commanding him what to do, there's a problem there. So come down, simply lay your problem at his feet. Allow Jesus to handle it his way. Um, so, ver and of course, Matthew 7, 7, ask and it will be given. Seek and you will find. Knock, it'll be opened. So verse 50, Jesus said to him, go your way, your son lives. So the man believed, and believe is the key word in the Gospel of John. So the man believed the word that Jesus spoke to him and he went his way. Why do you think that Jesus didn't go to Capernaum himself? Ac excellent. He wanted the man to grow in his faith. Absolutely. So, um, standing by and watching as another brings healing requires little faith, but to believe without being there, uh, without seeing for yourself, that takes faith at God's word, and we're going to see this. Verse 51, as he was now going down, his servants met him and told him, saying, your son lives, and then he inquired of them the hour when he got better, and they said to him, yesterday at the seventh hour, the fever left him. So the father knew that it was at the same hour in which Jesus said to him, your son lives. And he himself believed and his whole household. And this again is the second sign Jesus did when he had come out of Judea into Galilee. So Jesus severely tested this man's faith. So it must have been for his own good, right? It was Jesus knew what was best for the man. Sometimes we have to say that multiple times. Jesus is doing what's best for me because I might interpret my circumstances as different, as contrary, okay? So um, despite the test, the man took Jesus at his word and the noble man, he demonstrates true faith because um, remember that he, he booked it to get to where Jesus was, but he, he walked back. It says, um, in fear, the nobleman ran from Capernaum to Cana, but in faith, he walked back from Cana to Capernaum. And that's what he wants us today. Because, you know, sometimes you kind of get that hamster wheel going in your head, and you just kind of operate on worry and fear. And it's at that time that you need to interject the word of God. And, and so he's going to help us to realize what, what's important. So now, we're going to, with our remaining time, we're going to enter into the fourth period in our outline of the ministry of Jesus. This is the first period of the Galilean ministry. So he's returning to Galilee, and then at the end of the section, uh, the disciples will be plucking grain. So we're in Mark chapter 1. 
uh, verses 14 through 39. Now, what's happened where we're at chronologically is John the Baptist was put in prison because he told Herod, you should not take your brother Philip's wife, Herodias. That bad, okay? <laughs> that sin, that, that not good, okay? And so, um, yeah, Herod has him thrown in jail and eventually he's gonna lose his head, uh, literally. And so um, that's where we're at, verse 14, Mark chapter one. Now, after John was put in prison, Jesus came to Galilee preaching the gospel of the kingdom of God. Okay, so Jesus was from Nazareth uh, in the area of Galilee. That's where he did most of his ministry. Verse 15, and saying, the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. Okay, what time is fulfilled? We know from studying the triumphal entry, we know from Daniel chapter 9 that after the decree was given by Artaxerxes Longimanus, okay, uh, 173,880 days after that decree to rebuild and restore Jerusalem, we know that that's when the Messiah was going to come in on the donkey, right? The triumphal entry. So not only that, um, a lot of people will say and argue over... um, whether or not Jesus was Messiah, he had to come at that time that he came. We know that historically. It had to be at that time. Anybody here familiar with the Roman roads? Not the evangelistic tool, but the actual historical Roman roads. Um, over the course of 700 years, the Romans built more than 55,000 miles of paved high- highways, uh, which clearly hasn't happened in Missouri. Um, so that was throughout Europe, okay? Okay. So there was this expectation from John the Baptist. There was the testimony of Zechariah and Elizabeth. Um, suddenly with child. You got shepherds uh, talking that Jesus was born in Bethlehem. But the time now is fulfilled. Did Israel receive this invitation to accept Jesus? No, they did not. As a whole, they rejected him. And again, he came lowly as a king riding on a donkey, but he opened the eyes of the blind. He opened the ears of the deaf. He's healing lepers. Um, Romans eleven twenty five says that blindness is upon Israel, and thank God for this, as, as Mark uh, read the verse this morning, thankfully until the time of the fullness of the Gentiles is complete. Apparently, we are all Gentile, Gentiles here, okay? What does repent mean? Does it mean mean feeling bad for something you've done? Is that repenting? No, it means to change direction, right? Okay. And uh, it's actually a two-step for all you country music fans. Um, It's a change of mind that changes the direction of your life. You can't turn to Jesus unless you turn from your sin. Okay, so reject the idea that you can hold on to your sin with one hand and take Jesus with the other. Now, I'm talking about the sin that hasn't been forgiven if you haven't accepted Christ, okay? We all, newsflash, we all commit sins. Talk to our spouses, okay? So, um, (laughs) but what I'm talking about is the difference between you spending eternity in hell versus heaven, okay? So we're gonna look at verse 16 because Mark is just a Wabam gospel writer, we're going to look at uh, four fishermen called his disciples. Verse 16, And as he walked by the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and Andrew, his brother, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. So what I love is that it appears that Jesus picked average, everyday, working class guys to minister. He didn't go to Harvard, have a cup of coffee, okay? He didn't look for the uh, religious elite, he looked for hardworking guys. Um, Peter was identified later by his accent. So these guys were hicks, probably from the sticks, right? It wasn't a creek, it was a crick. Okay. Okay, now that I've offended everybody, okay? Um, this way, when God works, God gets the glory. <laughs> it's not like he got Gamaliel and Nicodemus and, I mean, just like everybody, you know, from, from college. He, he takes every, uh, everyday average working class people. So verse 17, Then Jesus said to them, Follow me. We love this. I will make you become fishers of men. And they immediately left their nets and followed him. Now Jesus did not in turn, uh, invent the term fishers of men. Um, It was actually a common description by philosophers and other teachers who captured men's minds through teaching and persuasion. But this is a, you would say this is a simple challenge, but basically what they're doing is they're saying goodbye to their lucrative fishing business and 
spouses and saying hello to Jesus for three and a half years. So we can't follow Jesus unless we're willing to forsake our own plans and wishes. And that's why James 1.8 says, a double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. So since we're in Missouri, we need to look at some fishing tips, right? I love this one. Don't keep telling only old fishing stories when your boat was full of fresh fish. We're talking about evangelism here, but I love it because a lot of times it it kind of, we can paint our past with a very interesting brush. Well, back in the day when Jesus really moved, this is what men did when men were really Christians. Now we're just fake Christians. No, Fishing, (laughs) fishing is telling your story. Everybody in this room has a different background. You grew up under different circumstances, okay? That's the story that you share. Learn to enjoy fishing by fishing. A lot of evangelism, especially if you're going to spend time with people, is simply describing how you're living according to this font. Because a lot of times people are looking at it like, well, this is kind of like social studies or something I fell asleep to in high school. No, if you follow Christ, you will have a living, vibrant life, okay? (laughs) There are many people that will attest to that. Um... Amber's best friend, uh, when she and I were to be married, um, actually rejected her for following Christ. And I remember she was asking her what prayer was like with God. And she was like, so is it like you're at Walmart and God says, don't buy the pears, you know? Um, And then I heard another guy say, uh, was it like um, going to the sky and just uttering words? Um, Mark quotes this verse a lot, but I just want to repeat it. If you will draw near to Jesus Christ, He will draw near to you and you will not miss him. And the way that you will know that, you start in the the New Testament and you head right, okay? And there are people here that will help you, that will talk to you. I scored a bunch of really great books, uh, which I forgot to bring this morning to give to you. So I'll have them here next week. There's a lot of good stuff that we can do, but we help each other, okay? If they can't perceive us living for Christ in real everyday life, why would they perceive uh, that the Bible applies to us in real everyday life? There needs to be an action uh, to, to what we read. So verse 19, I know you're all sweating. It says, when he had gone a little farther from there, he saw James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother, who also were in the boat mending their nets. And we see that John was a great met, uh, <laughs> Mender, great net mender, not a met nender. He was a great net mender. And that's, that's a characteristic of a pastor, okay? In life, church life, there's a lot of nets that needs mending, okay? Verse 20, and immediately he called them, and they left their father Zebedee in the boat with the hired servants and went after him. Okay, this is going to be one incredible long first day for the disciples with Jesus, okay? Yeah, so Mark gives this record of their first long day and they've dropped their nets to follow Jesus um, to be a student of the rabbi Joshua ben Joseph, okay? So when it says they in verse 21, we're talking about Peter, Andrew, James, and John at the very least, those four guys, okay? Okay. So they all go with Jesus. They go to synagogue because that's what you do when you're a good Jewish guy. So we're going to see Jesus cast out an unclean spirit. What's an unclean spirit? A demon. All right. So verse 21, Then they went into Capernaum, and immediately on the Sabbath, he entered the synagogue and taught. So we want to kind of step into uh, Jesus' home church here for a minute. Uh, Capernaum is his headquarters um, of his earthly ministry. In their synagogue service, um, they may not be able to, as Jews, make it to Jerusalem every Sabbath for celebration. So if not, they would go to synagogue. Um, What would happen, there were at least a few people that were in charge of the synagogue service, but one guy on Friday night breaks out a trumpet, and on Friday night, as soon as he's identified three stars in the sky, he blows the trumpet, And that lets everybody in Capernaum know Sabbath has begun. And then he'll do the same thing sundown, Saturday night, blows the trumpet, three stars, Sabbath is over, okay? So apparently a lot of trumpet uh, action going on there in Capernaum. Um, Also, the Old Testament text that would be expounded upon during synagogue would be the same all over the world, So that gets really interesting when Jesus, the Word of God, comes in and is going to teach the Word of God. 
So it would have been common for one of the rabbis, whether visiting or passing through, to speak, uh, especially if it was a Pharisee from Jerusalem or a scribe. Uh, this time Jesus was asked, and he, he teaches with authority. He teaches differently. Because I think um, one source I read, it sounds like these kind of services were typically boring, you know? Where are you from, Jerusalem? You're a rabbi? Come on, you're, in, you're up. So, verse 22, <laughs> this is great. They were astonished at his teaching, for he taught them as one having authority and not as the scribes. That word astonished, if you have Blue Letter Bible, app on your phone is very interesting. It means to be stricken with fear when Jesus taught. So again, the word of God is teaching the word of God. Nobody taught like that man. Verse 23, now there was a man in their synagogue with an unclean spirit, and he cried out, saying, let us alone. What have we to do with you, Jesus of Nazareth? Did you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. So the, the Greek language indicates that unclean spirit is a demon. Now, what are demons? Fallen angels, absolutely. Uh, we read about the fall of Lucifer. It's really easy to remember. Ezekiel 28, Isaiah 14, okay? Ezekiel 28 tells us that he fell. Isaiah 14 tells us why he fell. He wanted to be like God. And you read the I will statements in Isaiah 14. Okay, so he was, until he fell, he was the seal of perfection. And he had all kinds of uh, precious jewels as a covering. I don't know what that looked like, but apparently if you're into jewelry, uh, he was the guy. I don't know how else to say that. Um, but what happened was um, he committed uh, iniquity and he's cast out of his original position of ministry. So he's a fallen angel, he's a cherub, and he goes from Lucifer to Satan. Now, according to Job chapters 1 and 2, he still has access to God. Now, Revelation 12 describes him as the accuser of the brethren. You can see an aspect of this in Zechariah chapter 3, if you want to look at that at some point. But what Revelation 12 says is he's the voice in your head as a believer that accuses you day and night. If you were blood-bought, if you have given your life to Christ, God is not accusing you in your thought life day and night, okay? If you know the difference between condemnation and conviction, conviction means God speaks to your heart and says, here's some things that are gonna help you draw closer to God. If it's condemnation, those thoughts or the, the, what you're thinking about is gonna condemn you and try to push you away from God, and that way you can know the difference, okay? So uh, most commentators think, according to Revelation 12, that he took, Satan took a third of the angels with him. That's not for sure, uh, but that's what a lot of people think. Now, here's an interesting question. Why is a demon-possessed guy in a synagogue? Probably wants help, okay? Uh, demonic possession. When we're saved, please get this, we don't get possessed. Christians, born-again Christians, do not get possessed by the devil, and we reject that teaching. Some people teach that, okay? We are promised the gift of the Holy Spirit. John chapter 14, he's with us forever. We're sealed, Ephesians 1.13. We looked at Wednesday, 2 Corinthians 1.1, 1, 1, 1 John 4.4, 4, greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. And so the demonic realm can bother us. That's why we read, for example, Ephesians chapter 6. Um, you want the shield of faith. They're going to be fiery darts. Fiery darts can be serious harassment. How do I know this? Think about some of the thoughts you have when you're in church. <laughs> you're like, what? What was that? Where'd that come from? Hell. <laughs> it's not a mystery, okay? And we all have them. I don't care what anybody looks like on the outside, what kind of package or spiritual facade you got going on. Everybody has messed up thoughts, especially in church. Okay, this is not new news for anybody here, okay? fiery darts. The enemy wants to harass. How do you know the difference? God wants to give us his peace. Once you have had the peace of God, you will, you will not want, although our flesh will want, your spirit will not want peace from any other source. It doesn't come from your spouse. It doesn't come from your best friends. It only comes from God, and he wants that connection to be good, okay? So um, there, are gonna, there are some churches, again, that don't agree with this, 
Uh, in the case of demonic possession, um, that person is an unbeliever. They're not sealed by the Holy Spirit. The best way to describe it is like it's like a carjacking. Okay, your car has been taken over. Suddenly you're into the passenger seat and somebody takes over the wheel. Uh, and they begin to take you on this crazy ride and there's this battle for control over the vehicle. Uh, and it's very real. Uh, one commentator that I listened to in uh, Pennsylvania, after they taught this, they had a demon-possessed guy uh, in their uh, sanctuary. So here's a guy, demon-possessed, in a synagogue looking for help among God's people as we go to wrap it up. It's a very real phenomenon. Verse 25, But Jesus rebuked him, saying, Be quiet and come out of him. Jesus doesn't need press from demons. <laughs> he doesn't need demons to say, oh, this is the Son of God, okay? He doesn't need that. But know, know, know that there's power in the name of Jesus. And that's what's used. I've, I've never been involved in a, well, I, yeah, I, I haven't been involved in a um, casting out a demon, but um, I've talked to people that have. And you can talk to Pastor Pat afterwards, he has. Um, it wasn't Ann, though. It was somebody else. <laughs> Just to clear it up, Everybody's relieved. If you know Anne, that's why it's funny. Okay. Verse 26. When the unclean spirit had convulsed him and cried out with a loud voice, he came out of him. Then they were all amazed, so that they questioned among themselves, saying, What is this? What new doctrine is this? For with authority he commands even the unclean spirits, and they obey him. So who's in charge here? Jesus is in charge here. And he's Lord over them, and people are getting it. So verse 28, And immediately his fame spread throughout all the region around Galilee. Now, Matthew tells us at this time, because uh, we will look at Matthew 5, not this morning, which you're thanking God for, um, but it, Matthew 5 tells us at this time there were many people coming around from Syria, from all around Decapolis, uh, the ten cities. People are gathering to Capernaum because they're hearing about these miracles again, and they want to know what's going on. They want to see what's happening. And so what happens, I've never been to Israel yet, but I believe I'm trying to get Daryl Jones on board to get a trip for us to go. So, But Jesus, seeing the multitudes, um, he leaves goes through some valleys, some ridges, and he eventually goes onto a high mountain and he turns around and gives his first sermon. Where is that? Or what is that? Sermon on the Mount, okay? So why does he leave? Well, apparently you're not gonna catch this unless you go to Israel. When you go visit and you get there, you're gonna see multitudes of people there. And everybody's looking, in this case, for miracles. So Jesus takes a significant hike up a mountain, and what he's doing is he's thinning out the crowds. And the people that are just going to see a fireworks show, something supernatural, are not going to hike up the mountain for his teaching. But the people that want his teaching, and that's going to be our prayer for, for everybody here this morning, they're going to take that hike. Okay, and that's my prayer. Um, if you'll join me, saints, as I uh, invite the uh, worship team up, Lord, I want to pray for those that have not taken that hike this morning. Lord God, there's, there's something that in the words that were expressed this morning that you relate to, but you have never given your life to Jesus Christ. Don't leave here this morning without Jesus. Because he calls to you, and he says, call on me and I will answer you and show you great and mighty things which you know not. There are some people here that would think, Lord, if, if you only knew what I've done, you wouldn't save me. And yet we read in Isaiah 49 that he demonstrates our love um, by the piercings in his wrists. That's how much he loves us. And he loves us with, with a father's love. And my, my appeal here to you this morning is if that is you, I'm going to ask you to pray with me here this morning and, and just commit your life and your heart to Jesus Christ. If you've never done that before, if you're just going to pray with me, Father, I pray that you would um, bring Jesus into my life this morning. And I confess to you that I'm a sinner. And Lord, I've made mistakes, but I am tired of running my own life. And so right now, I confess to you that I believe that you're real. I don't understand all the Bible. I don't understand how these things work, but I know that forgiveness of sins is the living water that I need in my heart. If that's you this morning, I pray that you will again echo this prayer. Ask Jesus to come into your heart, save you from your sins. We're not going to end there this morning because for those that know Jesus, there are people here this morning that have been beat up. 
And there's an opportunity right after this last song to come up front and pray. Join together just another man, another woman here so that we can pray for you because we want to see you restored. We want to see you lifted up above your circumstance, above the things in your life right now that are difficult. We just pray these things in the power and authority of Jesus' name. And everyone said, amen.